A number of years ago, I was in, found myself in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I had been on the road hitching for about a week and a half, and I was on my way home. I may have shared with you how I was sleeping in a park and on a bench in Winston-Salem, and I was half awake, half asleep, and I see these two fellows running across, sneaking up on me. And how the Lord turned that to His praise. Well, this is the next day, and I am high in spirits. I'm enjoying the experience of His life. I'm enjoying what He's put me in this situation to discover, and that is what it's like to live out of His life. I did not understand it at the beginning, but in this experience, this, this season of experiences, he was showing me that we could trust Him and that He could be in our every step. He could be in every encounter. He could be in every circumstance. And He chose to be if we would just look for Him there. So it's early morning. I believe it's a Wednesday because I'm hoping to make Charlotte by nightfall. Not such a long drive, but not knowing how many rides the Lord would take to get me there and knowing that sometimes, although this had not been my experience, there had only been one other time that I had waited maybe any longer than 15 minutes. And I'd encountered a number of other hikers who on the road would say they'd be out there maybe for half a day or a day before they'd get a ride. But only on one occasion did it take two hours to get a ride and in that two hours the Lord was, was using so early this morning, I'm out on the side of the road, and it 15 minutes passed, 20 minutes passed, significant amount of time passed, and I get to ask questioning, Lord, am I not to be out here? Am I to be back uh, in Winston-Salem? Are you not done with me here? I didn't feel to turn around, so I'm out there for some more time, and a little more time passes and I decided, well, I must be belong back in Winston-Salem. So I'm heading off the interstate, getting ready to go back up the ramp. And just about this time, come under, coming under the overpass, uh, is this uh, little uh, Ford Pinto, I believe, something like that. It was a small, older Ford, beat-up Ford, and all the windows are down. Have I shared this here? And the closer they get, it's steaming out from under the hood. <laughs> and the closer it gets, I see that it, this little Ford has four occupants. And I cannot see how they can hold another. And I see that the four occupants are not the kind that I would normally pick for a ride. And they actually just kind of moving on past me, slowing down, and uh, I'm thinking, well, they weren't stopping for me, they're having car trouble, and I'm about to head up the ramp and look around, and there are these arms out the windows going like this, you know. <laughs> and so my agreement with the Lord has always been that don't let them stop unless there's something in it for you, for me, or for the passenger or passengers, and most times it's just one who will stop, rarely is it more than one, but this was a carload, four. And so my agreement was if they stop, I would get in. And so I'm making my way towards the car, and the closer I get there, I am not liking what I'm seeing. <laughs> there is a, a man in the front seat and a woman, and a young man, uh, th this one man front seat, I would say he would be in his early 40s, the woman would probably be in late 40s, early 50s, the boy in the back probably was no more than 20, maybe younger. The other man was the oldest man, he probably was in his late 50s. And they had a cooler between them in the back seat, so I had to get in the front seat between this and I didn't I would have thought she would have moved over but she didn't she got out and 
I got in. Well, I'd learned that it's good to be in prayer at all times, and so I was praying under my breath, and I was saying, Lord, have I missed you? Have I missed you? Lord, hoping that maybe he would say yes, and I, I could excuse myself, but he didn't. And I'm getting in, and I'm feeling uncomfortable because they, they are not looking good. They, they are a rather ragged bunch. They, they do not look good. <laughs> Patty has asked that I not tell you about her. Uh, I mean, she, they all were out of the hills. They were... Uh, they were <laughs> out, of the, out of the mountains. And I, I, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense to say mountains, but they are as rough as you could imagine. And that's what they look like. So I'm getting in the front seat, and they don't say a word. They don't say a word. And I get in, I say thank you, and they get to talking among themselves, rather rough. And uh, they, ha they do not ask me a thing. They don't ask me where I'm going. Uh, I was hoping they would ask me where I'm going, but they, they, and they get to cursing, and they're talking really bad, and I'm just sitting in the front seat and praying, and, and we're going, we didn't go very far, I don't know, maybe 20 miles, and of course it was already steaming, and uh, the young boy in the back spoke up and called Ricky, I believe it was Ricky, I can't remember the name, but I'll say Ricky, he said, Blanky blank, Ricky, if you don't stop and get us water, we're, we're liable to be pulled over or be stranded here and the police come along. And so I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> and so they pull off of this exit and there's a service station there and they go right by the service station. And they're heading off in the, into the country and they pull off the highway and head down this dirt road. And I'm feeling very uncomfortable. <laughs> and up to this point, there's been no conversation. And uh, we're a little ways down this road, and the older gentleman in the back, and up to that point, he had never said anything in any of the conversations. But when he spoke, I realized he's in charge. And he said, turn, turn us around, and let's go back to that service station and get some water. And there was a smile in my heart. <laughs> and I am, and as we're going back, I'm thinking, Lord, I think I need to bail out. I think I need to say this is as far as I'm intending to go. Uh, but I, I, I don't have peace with it. I, I do not have life in bailing out. I'm telling this story because we are embarking on seven weeks of living out of a life that's not our own. Speaking of the old man, the old woman. And there was no life in my bailing out. I, I, I could not feel life, and I certainly had trouble finding life with my reasoning at staying. Listen to how I am saying this. Nothing in my reasoning or my experience or my understanding or my experience from being picked up until we stopped at that filling station made any sense for me to stay. So I'm, I stay in there. Only Ricky gets out. He fills up with gas. He gets back in. Uh, I can remember this lady did not like me there. She, she just, I could, you know, you could just read their signs. It's, uh, I don't think she understood why we turned around. Uh, I forgot to tell you that when the young man in the back said, Ricky, we, going, we need to get some water, Ricky turned around. I mean, we're going down the highway at... 70 miles an hour, steaming, and he turns around, puts his hand over my head, and he taps that fellow, and the young man in the back seat only has shorts on. 
and his body is covered with sores, scabs and sores all over his body. And he says, blankety blank, blank, if you ever use my name in public again, you'll answer for it. Something like that. So, I know who Ricky is. And uh, he gets back in, and we're back on the road. It's like I'm not even there. They're cursing and just who they are. And we're, we're a ways down the road, maybe 40 minutes. I don't remember how long. It seemed like a long time. Uh, and a car steaming up again. And again, the young man in the back, he says, Ricky, we're going to get caught if you don't get some water. This time, Ricky is mad. He says, he turns around, he says, blankety blank blank, if you ever use my name again in front of a stranger, you'll be in the trunk too. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe there are dogs in the trunk. <laughs> I need to tell you, this was my last trip. <laughs> because when I tell the story, and Patty hears it, she never was comfortable, but she just could not handle it. But anyway, obviously, here I am. Again, Ricky pulls off the road, passes several service stations, and it's heading off to nowhere. And I am, these guys have bad intents for me. And again, we're off on a side road. Again, the older gentleman, the second thing, only the second time he speaks up, he speaks up and he says, let's go back to that service station to get our water, turn around. And Ricky looks back at him and obeys. I'm going to bail out. I'm saying, Lord, I've got to bail out. It doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> uh, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about that young man and his sores. And so we're pulling into the service station, and they're all getting out. And it just hits me. I'm to pray for this young man. Or I feel like I'm to pray for this young man. And I turn around, and I knew his name by this time. It was in the blankety blank. <laughs> and I turn around, and I say, I don't remember his name, Tom. I say, Tom, I, I notice your sores. And my God heals, and he's promised to bless those I bless. May I pray for whatever has caused what's wrong with your body. I don't know my exact words, but that was the intent. Everybody freezes in place. Ricky's at the door. She's turned and is about to lift off. The old gentleman, his door is open, but they are as quiet as can be. And this young man, I mean, all the eyes are on him, and he sits there for a second. He's, he's trying to handle what he's just heard. And he finally ends up saying, yes, would you? And I laid my hands over on this young man's knee, and I just pray a simple prayer, Lord, Tom needs you. And I believe by his yes, he's saying, come in and help me. I open my eyes, and everybody's gone but Tom. I see them trailing into the station. I'm now at the edge of my seat getting ready to get out, thinking, well, maybe I ought to get out. Maybe that's what the Lord had me do. So I'm standing up, and they're coming back out, and Ricky's in the front, and the woman and the older gentleman, and by this time Tom's in there. And they're walking out straight, Father, marching, and they're marching right for me. 
And Ricky comes up to me and he says, blankety blank, why didn't you tell me, tell us you were a man of God? We wouldn't have talked like we were talking had we have <laughs> known you were a man of God. And I said, well, I, I didn't think it necessary. I, I said I was appreciative of the ride <laughs> and uh, didn't say much more. And they said, where are you going? And I'm thinking, here. <laughs> <laughs> But you see, that was a lie. I said, well, I'm going to Charlotte. They said, well, we're going right through Charlotte. And we'll just take you wherever you want to go. I'm thinking, well, Lord, maybe. Well, anyway, I'm back in the car. We're pulling out on the highway. And Ricky's doing all the talking. And he said, now, what are you doing out here hitchhiking? Don't you have a car? Well, yes, we have two. Are you broke? Well, no, the Lord's provision is always ample. Well, what are you doing out here? Don't you know you could get in trouble? <laughs> and uh, I say, well, the Lord sends me out here because there are those out here that He cannot encounter in church that He loves and wants to meet. Oh. And they forget me and they go on with their conversation and then it catches, they, they remember who I am and they'll say something, guys, you know. They apologize and then they'll ask me a few more questions. Well, well what, what all are you doing? And I just start telling them how the Lord meets people out here and uh, how it's His way of reaching others. And uh, they say, are you needing any money? And I think carefully, and I say, well, no, I'm, I'm fine. Well, what are you going to do in Charlotte? Well, the Lord's sending me to a place there that He has a word for. Oh. So from forgetting I'm there to little bursts of remembering and then the questions, we make it to Charlotte. Where do you want us to take you? We'll take you right to the door. Anywhere you want to go. You, you need to eat? You know, we'll stop and get you something to eat? No, I says, I believe the Lord has another ride because I'm actually going to, to Matthews, which is just a little south of Charlotte, just right on the edge of south of Charlotte. And I think God has another ride for me. And He did. If you'll let me out at this intersection, I can't remember the interstate that heads south through Charlotte. And uh, so we're pulling up there, and I get out, and they're saying their words. And this woman really has never got into it. She's the only one that... And the man in the back, I could see he was pleased. I don't know how he fit into all of what was going on, but somehow God spoke to him and said, turn us around. And I know there was something in the trunk. Probably somebody in the trunk. They, they were in trouble. And they were running. It came out. They were, they were going as far as away from some place in West Virginia that they could get. Flo they were heading to Florida. And uh, I get out and they take off and all of a sudden the car stops and Ricky gets out and he's running back to me. He pulls just far enough away that they're out of his conversation. And he runs back to me and he's looking at me and he folds his hands and he says, hey man, we're in trouble. And he's speaking low. Now this is the one who on his own made the decision to head off into the country. This is the one who made the decision to pick me up. And he is back there and he's got his hands folded and he said, we're in trouble. Would you pray for us? He said, would you pray for me? And right there in the midst of all kinds of traffic, 
Here is this Ricky with his car steaming, running, and three other in trouble individuals. There he is, standing along the side of the highway, letting me put my hand on his shoulder. He's bowing his head. And I'm praying for him. I kept thinking I would see them in the paper somewhere, or I believe I'm going to encounter one of them someday. I don't believe that what the Lord was doing, I wasn't doing it. I believe that what the Lord was doing was not going to return void. I don't believe it was just for me. We've been created for another life that is not understood by what is right and what is wrong, what makes sense, what doesn't. I believe it's a life that's out of man does not live by bread alone but by every word that precedes or pro, excuse me, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. A life that does not turn what God has said into do's and don'ts and reasons for living one way or another, but that which God has spoken has led us to Him. And in finding Him, we're not satisfied with what He has said. We cannot live out of what He has said. No matter how many principles we can glean from it, no matter how many rights and wrongs we can end up with, we'll not be satisfied except by His proceeding word, what He is now speaking. Jesus came as the life, the life of God in man. Jesus spent three and a half years walking and teaching and demonstrating what it is for man, son of man, what it is for man. Never less than God, but no longer living anymore as God but having chosen to lay down that as God life, humbling himself, taking on the fullness of all that man was intended to be, now living out of a life that was not his own. Everything I do, I did not do, Jesus said. He could have done it, but he did not. He faithfully did not live out of his, himself. He did not speak from himself. He did nothing, nothing on his own initiative so that he might show us what that looks like. To show us that for which we were created the very tabernacle in creation of God Himself, the very house, the abode, the body of God Himself in the earth. We've talked about Jesus being the truth, the truth both about God and the truth about man. And the truth about God is that God has chosen to limit Himself to life in and through his man. God does nothing unless he has a man or woman. God does nothing in creation unless he has a man or a woman through which to do it. He is not a man that he should lie. He will not go back on his word. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let him rule over all of life and everything that is on the earth. It ends with 
that second man becoming the last Adam, bringing an end to a race that would not and that could not and that had only one alternative left and that was to be replaced, to die. God's solution was not to make better that old Adam. God's solution was to bring an end to that old Adam. That's why the Word of God speaks of Christ being the last Adam and the second man. God's redemption of you is not to make you better, but to replace you. God's redemption is to the end of bringing an end to you and bringing forth a new life out of a new birth. Born no longer of Adam's seed, but now from the very sperm of God. 1 John 3. And allowing that, mom, that man, that woman, that child to choose daily, hourly, moment by moment to let go of Adam's life and put faith and confidence and trust in the new life born of God. And Jesus came to demonstrate that as the truth, that it takes God just to be man, it takes God just to be woman, as God created us to be. You cannot know life, you cannot know normal human life without God having His rightful place on the throne of our hearts and our lives. Everything else is death. Everything else is death. And Jesus came as that truth. And Jesus came not only as that truth, but as the way. The way from Adam's life to the life for which we were created. The way of intimacy, of withness, whereby being with Him He will make us. All He's asking us to do is to believe. And that faith produces an obedience to Him. That faith is not a faith that comes by way of works, but it's faith that works because His life takes over and His life works. Are you hearing? Not a performance by the old man to attain, but a laying down by faith of the old man and trusting Christ to do what He by nature does naturally. And out of that faith and out of that trust comes forth a life that does not make sense to a John Brown getting into a Ford with four very scary, the worst of the world, but loved by God, every bit as capable of being the potential of a vessel of God as the John Brown raised in a Christian home that missed almost all of that stuff. I had my own stuff. It looked better kind of stuff. Most fe would feel comfortable with my kind of stuff. But it was as vile and as full of death and as full of going nowhere as these four in this little Ford Pinto. The good of John was no better than the bad of Ricky. They were both living off of the same tree. And we're going to talk about this other tree in our second half today, but Jesus came to show us that it's intimacy with, it is, it is in withness that He is able to draw us over the bow of this boat out into the life that only He can live in us. There's only one person that can live the Christian life, and that's Christ. And we do not live that Christian life by faith. We live that Christian life 
by Christ. It's by faith that we get over the bow of the boat. It's by faith that we in obedience get into the car that life is taking us into. Though our head and everything of the old man says, this does not make sense, this is not reasonable, this, in this car there is not life. But the life within is now reigning because it is out of that witness that he is able to live. It is by faith in him calling us across the bow. It is faith placing our trust in him in those areas that he has already announced to us that he's going to call us. That's what we spent the last seven weeks on. There's not a one of them that is reasonable. And there is not a one of them that you will find 99 out of 100 pastors who will tell you that, they, that is, it is acceptable or reasonable or expected by Christ in the Christian life. Say goodbye to all your own possessions. If I were to ask for a raising of hands, there's probably not a half a dozen of you, if there's any of you who have ever heard it preached, that's th that that is the way to liberty in life. That that is the way to prosperity in life. That that is the way to, the, to God's provision in life. That is the way to discover the supernatural abundance of everything that we need in every circumstance, in every situation. Though it may to man leave us looking like we're in poverty on occasion, may even leave us looking like we are hungry on occasion. I cannot tell you how many good brothers and sisters on a recent long fast have encouraged me that I had gone beyond reasonableness. And they were right. But the life was leading me on. And I cannot tell you how much of that life I discovered being beyond reason. And it is not done by hearing a principle of fasting and then moving out on the good of fasting. You'll find death in that. I've been on many fasts that I could not get beyond 10 days. There was no grace. You understand? But it's, it's following the life. It's hearing the life from within. It's and when you have that, the grace, I'm telling you, it's nothing. It's nothing. If the life is moving in this direction, you'd better be with the life because the death is, if the life is moving in this direction and you give up the fast in that illustration, there's death in giving up. There's no grace in giving up. I have felt death in giving up and I have felt death in continuing because life was not leading in either. But the knowledge of good and not so good. Better and best. You understand? We're going to be looking at living this other life. And I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will Get a hold of you in areas that He wants to take you. Into a witness, into an intimacy, whereby it does not make sense, but the life is so wonderful and so good. It's like soaring with the eagles. It's like walking on water. It's like, I cannot tell you what my heart was like when that pinto finally pulled off. I cannot tell you what I felt. Oh, the next ride was in a van, a work van, and a guy was selling auto parts, and a Christian. Boy, did I unload on him. I mean, I was so, so full of life and joy, and, and I was for a while. I mean, I just, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. 
for Patty. I trust you're hearing. I want to just have a, a brief reading here. No, I'm going to stop here. We're going to take a break. And then we're going to come back and look at a few spiritual realities and talk about the two trees. Father, I thank you for your life in our presence. I thank you for the witness of your life in my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Father, for the hunger that you've produced in all of us, for a reality that goes beyond anything we've experienced or, or are seeing in our Christian culture. Father, I'm just asking that there just be some way where not so much the syllables and sounds, but the breath of your presence would just somehow flow here. Father, I just breathe. Come forth. You be exalted, our Lord, in Jesus' name.